Hello, welcome to the Thursday, May 4th, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. If you have an email account, then you very likely saw an interesting Google Docs fish earlier today. Now, these emails typically arrived from valid Gmail accounts, not necessarily someone you knew. And what really sort of gave them away as malicious or odd was the two field in email, which wasn't your name. Instead, it was an email address that looked uh, suspicious. It had a lot of H's and followed by mailnator.com, at least the samples that I have seen. Now, the tricky part about this phishing attempt was that you typically never get asked for your password. What this fish is after is OAuth credentials. Now, OAuth is an interesting authentication scheme that you see used a lot by social media, by Google, and it allows you to assign certain privileges to applications. So the way OAuth works, you could assign privileges to an application that, for example, needs access to your Google documents. So the application requests this access from you, you authenticate to Google, and then basically tell Google that it's okay to let this particular application access your Google documents. And you probably have done that before. Facebook, Twitter, all of these social media sites also heavily rely on OAuth. The good part about OAuth is that this third-party application never actually needs to know your username and password. Instead, during that handshake where you approve the application, this application is being provided a very application-specific password that works only with this application and only allows access to specific items that you allowed access to. So in this particular case, the phishing attempt did just that. It asked you for access. Now, it didn't particular ask access not to Google Documents, but instead to read, send, delete, and manage your email. In addition, it also asked for access to manage your contacts. This may have given it away that this was not just a normal document that someone wanted to share with you, but if you clicked on allow, then Google issued an application-specific password, an OAuth token to this malicious application. It made it more likely for people to fall for it by calling itself Google Docs. But this is really just a name that this particular malicious developer came up with. Now, Google, of course, has figured this out pretty quickly. And that's where a second part comes in, where OAuth really sort of shines in that in addition to providing your token that the application gotten for you, the application also needs uh, to provide a special application secret that was created for this particular developer. So all Google had to do, and Google has done that now, is they had to invalidate this application secret. With that, all of these credentials that this application negotiated with Google became invalid. Valid. But of course, until this happened, emails kept spreading in particular because uh, this malicious application was able to then read, send, as I told you, and delete emails on your behalf and also manage your email account. If you got hit by this particular phishing attack, it's always a good idea from time to time to review the permissions that you assign to different applications. And I'm sure there are some that are valid that you actually want to have assigned. But uh, review that from time to time. And uh, Google has a URL that I'll post as part of the show notes. Also, if you go through the Google account security review, this will be part of the items that you'll be asked to review. Now, I don't think uh, this attack used a specific vulnerability in OAuth. It really used OAuth the way it was sort of intended. Of course, uh, with the intelligent naming of the application Google Docs, and also with the use of uh, nice Google-like uh, host names for uh, the domains that were used here, it was just very likely that people actually fell for this particular attempt. So I would expect that we'll see more 
like it in the near future. SS7, short for signaling system number seven, was developed in the late 70s, 80s in order to manage and automate connectivity between phone providers. The idea between SS7 is to implement features like, for example, call forwarding and to make them work even between different phone companies. So in essence, it's uh, pretty much uh, the routing protocol for the phone system, pretty much like BGP, the border gateway protocol is the routing system for the internet. And very similar to BGP, SS7 is also a very trusting system in that it does accept messages from pretty much anybody. The assumption here is that only phone companies can send these messages and that phone companies trust each other. Of course, that goes out the window if one of these phone companies gets breached or even large businesses or such that are being given access to SS7 are being compromised or abusing this access. In particular, with mobile phones, uh, SS7 has become more and more important in that, for example, it does take care of roaming of phones between providers and the like. So it's very important, for example, that the phone network, the global phone network knows through which provider your phone is currently reachable. So while uh, people have talked and demonstrated this vulnerability for a long time, so far we're really short in actual exploits that happened off this infrastructure. Well, that's changed now with German phone company O2 stating that it is aware of several attacks against online banking customers that took advantage of SS7 weaknesses. In this particular case, SS7 attacks were used to redirect SMS messages that were supposed to be going to that particular customer's phone for two-factor authentication. Of course, we all know that NIST recently came forward with saying that SMS is not really sufficiently secure for this kind of authentication, but still it's widely used. And while the next generation of wireless phone networks, these 5G networks are proposing a different protocol, doesn't necessarily mean that this new protocol diameter is significantly more secure. The basic problem remains that if a phone company around the world tells your own phone provider that your phone is located within the network, then your phone provider pretty much has to trust that message. There are some efforts in place to look at, for example, very fast movements geographically of phones and to do some anomaly detection that way. But uh, you can imagine with hundreds of millions of phones in use right now that uh, this is quite difficult. Well, uh, that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.